everyone. Thank you so much for joining for everybody online and here in person. On, I thank you guys. So, this is Allied. Welcome to Allied Arts Gallery. We're in uh, Richland, Washington, by Howard Amon Park, and on Felicia Ballum's Night Art Exhibition, Make It Plain, Part Two. And we'll I'll give you a little quick rundown of the whole show. On, but first, I wanted to say I wanted to, we're going to have Corey Jenkins Jr. and Brandon Sullivan performing. I'll let them give quick intros about themselves in a bit, and also share their social media with you guys. You guys can all follow them. On. But first of all, the show is the first time I had this body of artwork. So the part two uh, is because it was the first time, or second time. On um, the four black and white pieces behind me are from the first exhibit, Make It Plain, which was an argument for African American history and why we needed, or an argument using African American history and why we needed the Black Church um, in America. And so this one is using a lot of those same pieces but also responding to the idea of let's work through and process our history and work towards unity um, by remembering our past, lamenting about it, acknowledging it, and then um, working through that. So that's what the overall show is about. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and have uh, Corey come up and he'll talk a little bit about um, spoken word and poetry. All right, hello everybody. Um, when you think of spoken word, it's poetry, but it's just you know, not poetry written down necessarily. Um, it's more performative, so as you're, somebody's up here saying their poem, it's more engaging, engaging, having the audience engaged a little bit more instead of you reading it on paper or in a book and you know taking the meaning away after you read it, like how you think of it. Um, but with it being performative, you get more of the idea of the poet actually delivering the poem the way that they want you to understand it um, and kind of connect a little bit more to, to what's being said. Um, and a lot of it, at least within the African-American culture, it really, when you think about it, starts, and a lot of cultures have had storytellers, but when you think about it, within Africa, you've had griots, so storytellers who would pass down information, you know, over the centuries and over the years, uh, to make sure people remember, be it lessons, be it family stories, or just stories in general, um, and using uh, repetition and alliterations, and those things after you know people being taken away to other places still stayed with the people regardless. So when you think of you today, kind of think of it being a song, but that's really still spoken word. But started to add a little more uh, musicality to it in a way, I guess, to help. You know, get the message across between between other slaves, um, and then as the years went on, when you think about speeches like the "I Have a Dream" speech or others, uh, that also uses the repetition and the alliteration there to make sure that you understand, that really getting the point of the message that's being brought across. Um, and as you continue to progress, that that uh, that process is stayed, um, and then you think of the '70s with the Black Power movement. Uh, you know, people were still doing poetry, and it was still to talk about what's going on, the issues that's currently ha that were currently happening. And uh, the big one that a lot of people know, the, the revolution was televised. That is considered spoken word as well. Um, and you just you know kind of keep going within history. That stays within the community and gets passed down. And you know you get rap and other genres that come come from it. Um, and then you also have poetry slams, which are kind of like a subset of spoken word which I believe was in Chicago, where you know, it was kind of like a competition between spoken word artists um, and see, you know, see who, who could win in that way. But um, that's really, in a, in a nutshell, spoken word is really just performative, performative poetry. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. All right, so we've got uh, Brandon, he'll be doing a poem next. Hello, everybody. So my name is Brandon. Half of you here know me. Maybe some of you online don't. Uh, I'm just a local Tri-Cityan. I um, kind of grew up around the world. I'm a missionary kid, born in Portugal, lived in Africa half my life, and that's the really, really short version of my life. Um, I'm currently just a barista slash poet, and I got into spoken word about four years ago, right around the time that I went sober. 
been writing poetry for about seven, so uh, I just really appreciate the communal spirit of everything. And it's really nice to like have this right now because of all the COVID and pandemic going on, this is like an aspect of it that like, I've really missed, so it's like really cool. Uh, one of the things is that um, a lot of you may have heard through movies or whatever is the whole like snap spoken word uh, tradition. So like it means just a way of expressing approval for the artist or whatever they're saying without being disruptive, like clapping or shouting. Of course, if you feel really exuberant, you can like clap or shout. <laughs> uh, so this first poem, I won't give you much introduction uh, other than to say that I think a lot about uh, human nature and what exactly that, that is. And there's a lot of, I don't know, a lot of thoughts on that out there, a lot that I agree with, a lot that I disagree with. And I kind of wrote this poem kind of in response to some of you more, I don't know, I won't even say common. Just, I wrote this poem. Every poem is a response. So uh, it's called Animalistic. And I hope you enjoy it. So I had a neighbor who was from the planet Zark Fabulacron. You know the one, in the Arcturus Prime Nebula? Anyway, one night he said to me, Brandon, inside every flup, flup was his species, you see, inside every flup live two grickles. One grickle is good. Kindness, love, humility, benevolence. The other grickle is evil. Envy, lies, greed, arrogance. I stopped him before he could continue. Earth's version has two wolves, symbols of the battle between good and evil in the hearts of all people. The one you feed is the one that wins. Bob's expression was great and, yes, Bob. Look, just because he's from Zark Fabulacron doesn't mean he can't have a normal name, all right? That's offensive. In any case, I had a problem with the stories of the wolves and the grickles. I said, first off, Bob, a plump wolf is a slow wolf. Now keep that in mind when you picture a starving wolf. Eyes bulging, lips curling, he will do anything to feed. He'll attack a grizzly bear, so why the hell wouldn't he rip out the good one's throat? Plus, I don't just have two wolves locked in this rib cage. I've got velociraptors, chameleons. I've got lions. I have a zoo inside of me. <laughs> I watch like a hawk with eagle eyes who wouldn't even hurt a fly because he's letting sleeping dogs lie as they let cat after cat out of the bag on a wild goose chase. Bob opened his mouth to speak, but I cut him off. Hold your horses, Bob. I'm as busy as a bee, mad as a hornet, opening a can of worms to wolf down the butterflies in my stomach, like I'm a pig-headed guinea pig headed for a barrel full of fish I'll shoot until the holy cows come home at a snail's pace from the rat race in this dog-eat-dog -dog world that also happens to be my oyster. And none, none of these beasts are domesticated. Even if I could let the good wolf feast, I fear the evil one may have a closet full of sheep's clothing just so he can pull the wool over my eyes. So how am I supposed to keep this wolf at bay if I can't even recognize him? Maybe I'm the boy who cried wolf because there's just me alone howling at the moon. When I finished, Bob looked like he was in pain until his chest exploded and a grickle with its arachnid appendages crawled from the gore, carrying the severed head of another grickle. Huh. I guess it wasn't a metaphor. Thank you. This uh, poem of duty is called, I guess it's more of a sound than a word. Uh, okay. I keep thinking and thinking and writing and writing and crying and crying and being angry. Wash, rinse, repeat. I can make it through the day, right? I can gather myself up enough to do what needs to be done. 
And then the thought, no, thoughts hit. It could have been me. It happened again. When will this end? Wow, you're not really my friend. So much for getting what needs to be done, done. My head is just constantly spun. What do I do? What can I do? Breathe, I need to breathe. <gasps> oh no, I can't breathe. Words that too many have said and often not have wound up dead. Okay, there goes my head. Think, think, there I go again. Protest. I must confess, that doesn't seem like a bad idea in this time of distress. Releasing my feelings, if only temporarily, to be with other people if at a big family meal. That's what I do. Solidarity is key. There are others who feel like me, those who look like me, those who are the same age as me, and younger and older, and those who stand with me. And together we can come to be the very force that makes the change that needs to be. I feel a little bit more hopeful. Change has got to come. No, change is coming. We will not rest until all issues have been addressed. Yes, small steps have to happen, but with me and you, change will happen. Black Lives Matter, the phrase alone stands on its own. and lament and mourn and really see some of the tough things in our history and on. Behind me, there's 230 nooses. Each one of those nooses represents someone who was lynched in the year 1892. Um, 1892 is, one of, is the, one of the highest years of lynchings. Uh, between the 1880s and the 1920s, there were a ton of them. Those are some of the peak years. And so uh, later than a lot of people think that it was happening, on. Um, yeah, if you guys get a chance to either come down here or those of you that are here, spend some time in front of this piece and just take in um, the, the, the fact that lynchings were a huge part of culture in the South for a while. Um, we had what were called Negro barbecues where people would go out after church services on Sundays, um, put, put it in the newspapers and go have a lynch mob. And um, part of the barbecue part is they weren't considered successful unless people went away with a part of the charred body. Um, so these, these are some really, really dark stories. We're, we'll hear um, one more of the stories from this piece of artwork, it's another really dark, hard one, and at the end it all, there will be more of the processing, um, helping people work through it. We're not gonna end on this note, but I do encourage you guys to feel the things that you feel and, and work through that. Those are valid emotions, whether it's anger, fear, pain, um, frustration, uh, any of those things, uh, this is real stuff that's that's hard and uh, needs to be worked through and processed. So, uh, as we listen to some more poems, I will, yeah, we'll listen to some poems. Thanks, Felicia. Um, so. I wrote a poem, like, once that all this stuff started happening back in April, May? I don't, I think the whole George Floyd thing, I don't know, was it May? Um, feels like so long ago. Um, and I didn't want to, I write a lot of poetry and I didn't want to just dive in with the first thing off the top of my head. <laughs> like I wanted to take time to sit in it and just sitting in the um, learning to mourn the evil that like exists in this world and understanding what it means. Uh, and so I wrote this poem kind of about that. And uh, I don't want to say a lot because uh, I just wanted it to speak for itself. So it's called Fallout. And uh, yeah. My brain belongs to me, said the fool who failed to understand neurochemistry and consequences. So, consequently, long ago, I let in a contagious mental guest who proceeded to sneeze on everything I own. He was not what I thought he was. 
I kicked him out, this cranial roommate, this brain-born viral agent who piggybacked on adultery, played hacky sack with the definition of infidelity, and to this day, I am still finding nicks and knacks he infected. Most of my will, but bric-a-brac collected under dust, I'm afraid to touch anything because everything is soaked in that putrid carnal stain and no matter how many coats of shame I put on, I'm still so cold for my fate was sealed from the moment I let him in. If you don't get it yet, I'm talking about my addiction to porn, an appetite engorged with the warmth of a thousand strangers. So my blood now beats with a consistent demonic scream, an imp pulse, to reduce any and every female form to shank, loins, and cheek, segregated meat. I am become decay with every artery carotid. Let's not romanticize this ugliness. I sold my soul to the lowest bidder, or perhaps the most bitter, my captors, compulsion, and narcissism, for my principles are apparently property my integrity not worthy, or at least not worth much. Bought by the beast for the price of a midnight rush, I'm not asking for sympathy. Nobody, no, not a soul coerced me, so maybe call this a confession? A dissection of the long-term consequences of my choices. The neurochemistry of evil, if you will. You see, it's actually been months since the peak of my addiction subsided, yet in its wake, I, with deaded mind, am awake, a vigil of protests mourning the death of my free will. I said I am awake, unable to sleep as the cries of enslaved neurons bellow from the neural pathways of my brain, that I, in my silence, and all the years of violent glimpses to a screen filled with flesh, chose the side of the oppressor, my own dark nature, who shackled my will to ships bound for deadly shores. I have a dream, or I had a dream, that my brain belonged to me. Because I banished the monster from my heart, and if you pass a law, you never have to deal with the repercussions again, right? Said the fool who failed to understand neurochemistry and consequences. Do you still not get it? When I look within my soul and see such devastation, so many places for the arachnid remnants of the creature to hide, I can't help but see myself in the beginnings of this nation. Both of us built upon a destructive mindset that is largely internal, but often manifests in physical ways and has infiltrated the bedrock of human interaction. Call it lust, call it racism. But please understand neurochemistry and consequences. If I am one man with a 15-year viral house guest, and I'm still cleaning up the toxins he left behind, still needing to exercise caution in the corridors of my mind, then how much more rampant would a sin as wretched as slavery run red through the veins of an entire country? I don't really care if you use the term systemic racism, and I'm not going to throw graphs, pie charts, and stats at you because I prefer not to load the chambers of my heart with bullet points, wielding facts about black death like the slugs that killed them. I mean, does it bring anyone any comfort to carry around names like their numbers? The skin and bones of kidnapped, raped, and beaten image bearers lying the stones upon which we built our prettiest monuments. And there are grandparents among us with memories of atrocities legally sanctioned, but we pla passed some laws a few decades ago, so we don't have to deal with the repercussions, said the fools who failed to understand neurochemistry and consequences. The tattered, recovering remnants of my brain are a testament to the fact that it takes more than a proclamation to kill a sin. Otherwise, it would just be a bad habit. Easy to kill it, bury it, and move on. But spiritually, mentally, 
neurochemically we know this isn't true. These things take a long time. Evil isn't just individual. Our souls were created for the communal, the transcendental. So sin is therefore generational, consummational, eager to impregnate hearts, to birth abuse upon descendants innumerable. I can't present you with a manual. If the way out of this was merely instructional, statistical, we would have found it by now. I suspect the answer is more conversational. Speaking from personal experience, it helps to talk about it, to not be told that my problem doesn't actually exist because this beast subsists on a diet of denial and blissful ignorance. My brain hasn't belonged to me for a long time. Ever since I, like my founding fathers, stole a, person, a people's right to exist apart from what they could do for me. Call it lust. Call it racism. Both are cancers abundant in our hearts, mine and my country's. Entangled as we are with spirits of hatred and slavery, tumors hidden, legion, and eager to grow. Malignancy that cannot be shamed into submission, nor extracted with a scalpel. No, what we need is a miracle, for consequences are always more than neurochemical. Thank you. from the graphic designed water bottle, or not water bottle, <coughs> graphic designed whiskey bottle. Um, so there were 13 black people that were lynched for this one crime that none of them had committed. Um, and Mary Turner was one of them. She was hung upside down from a tree. Uh, her body, her eight month old baby was cut out of her body, thrown on the ground, stomped, and then uh, she was riddled with bullets afterwards and lit, lit on fire. And so that's, um, this piece is remembering that, and I know it's hard, it's a terrible, hard, sad, graphic, um, disturbing story. Um, but I think these are some of the things that we do need to remember, that these other poets have talked about, that there's some terrible things. And I'll read uh, the poem on here that, um, this is my poetry contribution, it's, it's a short one. Uh, In the breeze forever, their memory will loom. A beautiful mother died and her child cut from her womb. That little river, a diseased and painful scar, your name forever worth more than this empty bottle and a simple cigar. You remember your strength now. And so that on. The cigar and the whiskey bottle come from her memorial, her grave site. This is what was left on her grave for her tombstone. So it was a whiskey bottle with a cigar stuck in it. And so that's what we have to remember her. So on. Feel free to come up and look. This is designed by, I did design it. Um, there's a little bit more about the details of the story there. All right, let's, I think we have, is it Brandon and then Corey again for two more poems? Awesome, guys. I'm gonna wipe down. Um, so this poem I wrote for um, uh, the Immigrant Coalition put on an art show at Monarca Winery um, last fall, last fall, something like that, and I wrote this uh, for their for their show. So I hope you guys enjoy it. It's called Common Ancestry. I've never understood the idea that the United States is the greatest country in the world. And I wonder if it's a contest we should even be playing. Because in an increasingly global society, it doesn't feel particularly noble to proclaim our own grandeur to a worldwide audience. Yet, 
The loudspeaker at the foot of the Statue of Liberty booms with patriotic glee. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, the tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Okay, it's not a loudspeaker exactly, but this poem by Emma Lazarus does speak volumes. With a literally engraved invitation cast upon the land of any nation not our own, that we indeed have a safe place for the unsafe to be. We have something worth sharing from sea to shining sea, even as we see that other peoples do too. So let us build together this new colossus we call us. When I was growing up, the history books told me that this country was a melting pot. And I can't help but feel that this is kind of homogenous, as if the Statue of Liberty would instead be screaming, come join me to be just like me. But this proposal doesn't have the same ring to it. You see, instead of a melting pot, I'd rather think of us as a patchwork quilt. Cultures, colors, and languages stitched together with time and history's bloody fingers. A great experiment meant to showcase liberty and diversity in a way it had never been before, which is why it seems weird to think of America as the greatest, without understanding that our roots are the tempest-tossed strangers who sought welcoming shores and found them, allowing us to be born miraculously just a couple of centuries later only to trumpet our country's superlative ways, as if chance or coincidence mean more than the vast and treacherous distances traveled by so many immigrants desperate to answer the Statue of Liberty's call. Does this land belong to the people who just so happened to be selected by the cosmically imbalanced scales of destiny? Or does it, should it, belong to those who worked harder than most of us could ever know to get here, or even those whose tribes were trampled when the colonists first arrived. Now, I'm not here to dig up the buried, oft ignored red and black bones of our nation's history, and I won't even dive into the obscenely complicated immigration bureaucracy. Most of us can't be activists or politicians, and I'm not even gonna tell you that your one voice can make a difference even though it can, because this isn't some Hollywood story where the white kid gets woke and becomes an inspiration to a room full of colors and cultures so foreign to his own. I'm not trying to paint a simplistic picture of the complex tapestry we've been given, but I can tell you that I don't believe this is the greatest country in the world, yet it is located on the most habitable planet in the galaxy, which, as far as we know, is the only one to contain such diversity of humans with kaleidoscopic skin tones and ancestry, colorful paths, producing colorful paintings that help to show us the immigrant himself is God's heart made manifest in the foreign, the different, the tired, poor, huddled masses yearning to breathe free. I came from my mother's womb, and even if my neighbor came from another country, they came from a womb too. We both immigrated from God's imagination. We both long for liberty. So whether or not America is the greatest country is of little importance to me. Perhaps we should worry more about compassion and less about some non-existent competition. Thank you. Um, this poem is titled Over It. Uh, I wrote it mm, maybe two years ago. Um, and some of the things it's still relevant, not much has changed. Uh, and then, so I forgot to say earlier, the uh, poem earlier I wrote, uh, I think it was in June? Either June or July, because it was just in response to the protests that I saw here, which I honestly didn't think would happen out of the seven years I've been out here. I was quite <coughs> surprised. Um, okay, here we go. I'm over slavery. I'm over it. 
That's what you often hear in today's time, that or a variation of its kind from young to old to black, brown, white. The conversation has lost its might. It might be tiring, exhausting, and downright annoying to be reminded of this destroying fact, but the vestiges of it still exist. Because of it, three amendments persist. Black codes, which are based on slave codes, where Southerners wanted us to work for low pay and have us walk around like that was okay, essentially going back to being enslaved. And at the same time, restricting the right to vote just because of the type and amount of melanin our skin promotes. Hey, the Freedmen's Bureau seemed like an advance. With Reconstruction, we were given a chance. We could voice our concerns. We could rock the vote. Oh, looky here, I can now read this note. That didn't last long. It was a brief romance. Hello, Jim Crow. Is this happenstance? Black and white sections for public facilities talk about having no sensibilities. I really have to control my pride that I just saw my uncle and cousin hung down by the riverside. I think I want to go up north. There's got to be a better opportunity. At least there'd be some type of immunity. Civil rights movement taking on Jim Crow. Looky here, man, it's time to go. Three fifths of a being. Oh, hell no. That ended upon free. We as a nation need to uphold that all men are created equal. Let that be said bold. Marching and sit-ins and shut-ins commenced, leading to additions to the government. The Civil Rights Act of 1965, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Civil Rights Act of 1968, we're here now because of those dates. But recall, or hear about it now, voting concerns have recently sprawled, from closing precincts early or altogether, to limiting early voting or purging the rolls, just to name a few. Oh, how I wish that this weren't true. And you thought the uh, Redlining Act was passed? Come on, man, what did you really think? Ask the number of people that are part of that cast. And let's not forget, really, how can we? Target practice, all willy-nilly. This doesn't sound familiar to you at all. It just about makes me sit back in law. But just know that other comparisons could be made. But just know that slavery hasn't really been maimed. It's morphed and reared its ugly head in different ways, almost unfazed. You may be over it, but it's not over with you. The vestiges are here through and through. Now, I'm not saying to dwell on it, because that could indeed be a pain. But just know where it is from whence you came. Too many people fought and died to make a change. So don't be over it. Acknowledge it and continue to fight when you see parts of it try to ignite. History is history. Yes, you can change the past. But you better learn from it or your ass is grass. <laughs>
There's other symbolism as well within an art community where artists, we can be kind of judgmental, I guess, in some ways. And there's certain types of art that aren't really considered art. Quilting and craft isn't really something that we see in an art space that often, um, especially for someone who went to art school and did graphic design. Like, There's not many graphic design people that want to put quilts in an art gallery. And so I wanted to respond to that, that art idea that quilt is art as well, um, and also that this, the, this process, there's another aspect, the communities that do quilting, they will sit together in groups of usually women, but sometimes men will join too, and they hand stitch these quilts together at a big table. And so it's, it's a really neat symbol of how a community can come together and work through something, have these conversations, and then the children and the men and other parts of the family that didn't make the quilts can come together and do what's called tying the quilt, which actually, um, for my confirmation in high school, everybody tied quilts together. And so it's it's something that you can do with your family and your friends, and I, but it also has a really deep history going back to, there's, we're not sure if it's myth or true story, but most of us have heard about the, the Underground Railroad and the usage of quilts to tell, um, there's a couple samples over with these pieces that show the arrows, the directions to go, and different things like that. So a lot of us have seen and heard of quilts. If you've taken an art class, a lot of times kids' art classes will do quilts when they talk about African American culture and slavery. So there's, there's a lot of aspects of the quilts. And we heard Brandon mention quilts as well during his poem. Um, it's like they tie things together really well. Um, that was not meant to be a pun, but it, they do. <laughs> um, and so yeah, that's, I wanted to end on something that was about unity and the ideas of people coming together, having conversation at a table. Um, if you can have groups of friends either on, on Zoom if you're not doing things on person or in a backyard while it's still warm enough, um, do s'mores or something like that and have people that are different from you over. I'm gonna encourage everyone to bridge these gaps, start having conversation. Like one of you guys talked about converse, talking in your poems and there's so many things we can do um, but it, I think it's, if, if you're not the, there's a, I have a protest wall here too, so there, there's a little bit of protest in the show, but if you're not the type that doesn't, if you're the type that doesn't want to go protest, but you want to do something, start with your own community, start with the people you know, and that's, um, the quilts are in the show to represent that, the, those different, several different ideas, but, um, so I'll go ahead and conclude on that, so, um, Thank you guys so much for coming, and thank you guys so much for watching. Um, I really, really appreciate all the support. So, oh, <laughs> and actually, I'll have the guys come up um, to share where they can be found on social media too. Um, I'm Felicia Fallum at Felicia Fallum. No spaces, no capitalizations. Pretty much everywhere. Um, Felicia Fallum Art on Facebook, Instagram, and then. Yeah, everywhere is Felicia Fallum. My name is not super common. <laughs> so, all right, yeah. And Brandon and Corey, I'll have you guys go ahead and come up and share where you can be found on social media for that as well. Thanks, guys. That was super cool. Um, so, yeah, I can be found on most places under a poet proses. A-P-O-E-T-P-R-O-S-E-S -E -E -S on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. That's very, I took a long time to pick the same because it's hard to find a username that's not picked. <laughs> um, and then on Facebook under author Brandon T. Sullivan. And uh, yeah, I post a lot of stuff. I, I do like spoken word poetry. I also do like fiction um, and kind of like a lot of different, mostly like writing kind of stuff. And I also like do like movie reviews sometimes. I don't know, lots of different stuff. I do write a lot of words. Anyway, that, that's enough words for me. Next person. <laughs> um, this doesn't happen often where I have to plug this <laughs> stuff. Uh, on Facebook, you know, I just Corey Jenkins Jr. Um, on Instagram, it's not long, but it's the one in the letter N, only C E L J A Y C L J. Uh, and on YouTube, it's also Corey Jenkins Jr. That's it. Oh, and the website, Corey Jenkins Jr. That's it. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, guys. That's cool. That's, yeah. <laughs>